Glad to be here this evening. Beautiful, beautiful community here, and thankful again to Liberty Baptist Church having us in uh, tonight. My name is Byron Sanders. I'll have my family stand over here. Uh, missing one, one, I guess, redheaded Bo. He is in uh, the nursery. I have Abigail, Hudson, Hannah, my wife Rachel, and Andrew. You guys be seated. Uh, for the past 10 years, I was in Arizona. We planted a church there in Arizona. In fact, that's where uh, we met Dawn. And Arizona, that she came out with a youth group, and uh, we were still meeting in the school at that time, and put on a vacation Bible school for us. All many kids saved, and uh, picked up a few families from that. I think 09, 2010, 2009, uh, right there. And so, yeah, for the last 10 years, we uh, planted a church in Arizona, five acres, five build, uh, five buildings on that property. God blessed the work there. Strong congregation. We turned it over to a man. I resigned the church there in August. And begin the process of moving to Washington State. God uh, solidified a call to me back into church planting, burdened my heart, and we're ready to sh- search diligently if this is what God wants us to do. And and sure enough, He showed us the way and, and wants us to do that. And I began to look all over the Western United States. We looked at California, Oregon, but God never opened the doors. We never really felt a call there. Uh, and then I got a call from a friend in Washington. He got news that I was looking to maybe plant another church, and he showed me the western side of Washington State, up and down the whole western side towns and communities. They would, uh, coming from Arizona, they would point to, to trees, uh, the pastors that I were with, and said they would say, there's 100,000 people over there. All I saw was 100,000 trees, amen? <laughs> and, uh, in Arizona, you could see all the homes, the millions and millions of homes there in Phoenix. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, they showed us Ferndale, showed me Ferndale, and God really... It burdened my heart, and he called us right uh, there. Uh, for the past 18 months, two years before uh, going up there, uh, Bellingham Baptist Church, which is five miles south of Ferndale. Has anybody ever been to Ferndale, Washington? It's a beautiful area, I mean, really, and uh, uh, we're glad to be there. But uh, uh, five miles south of uh, uh, Ferndale's Bellingham, and Bellingham Baptist Church, Pastor Josh Carter, who now is our sending pastor, he had a problem. He had too many people crammed into his auditorium, and the city would not let him build or add on. And so he asked a church if they would consider praying about planting a church in one of the communities some of his members come from. And they began to pray about it, and God answered their prayers. God showed them Ferndale, and uh, folks agreed to go, and a handful of people. When we got there in October, they were running in the mid-teens. The last month or so, now we've been in the mid-40s. And so God is really blessing up there. We've seen a few saved, baptized two uh, two ladies uh, recently, and uh, we've started, when I, when I got there, we only had one service on Sunday mornings. We started Sunday nights. We started a midweek, midweek service on Thursday nights. We see very faithful attendance. And then because of lack of workers, and uh, uh, we have a few teenagers coming, we started a teenage, uh, teenage class, and that's going on tonight. A couple of our men there are working with the teenagers tonight. And so we had our first uh, one last Wednesday night, nine teenagers. Uh, we, gave a, we gave an invitation, and nobody got saved, but we gave an invitation and a couple of the girls raised their hand, no, you know, ask for prayer for salvation. And so God has an open door there. God is just working. Exciting things are happening. Uh, we do have a prayer card here. Uh, one of our kids will hand you one, I'm sure. Uh, on the back of our prayer card, once you get it, you'll see our little building there. It's a used to be a brethren, uh, congregational brethren church built in 1907, but it's really a wonderful building. And and Bellingham Baptist Church, before we got there, put about thirty-five thousand dollars in restoration in the building. And then we got there and raised some more money. We've got more, new carpet, um, built a sound booth. It really looks nice. And uh, when we started the church in Arizona, we started in a school. And then that's tear down, set up, tear down, set up. And not in that order. You want to set up first. Set up, tear down. And, uh, and so, but to start, to start in this uh, location, it's just a blessing. It puts us a couple years ahead of the game. My heart is for church planning, and we want to duplicate what God is doing there in Ferndale. We'd like to uh, help and plant more churches in the state of Washington. Again, we're very thankful to be here. Uh, I think we, I talked my family into singing. They remembered a whole song. They remembered a song. And uh, so I think they're all going to come up, except maybe for Andrew, and uh, they're going to sing. And so, again, thank you for having us, brother. All righty. Go ahead and turn your Bibles, please. Ruth chapter number one. Ruth chapter number one. And if it's okay, if we can stand in honor of the Word of God tonight, and uh, we'll go ahead and read our five verses. Ruth chapter number one. If we're not careful as believers, as children of God, if we don't guard against unbelief or lack of faith in our life, you know, one of the things, the dangers of unbelief is. It will lead us eventually to run from God's will for our lives. 
And it, it will. And so we're going to look at a story this, this evening, a very familiar story to you. Uh, and I want to preach to you a little bit on the sin of unbelief. Look at verse number 1, Ruth chapter 1 and verse number 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, not a very good time in Israel's history, that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the names of the man, and the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Molon and Chilion, Ephratitus of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. What well, happens in ten years? Yes. Think about last ten years. I mean, you never thought about getting into a stranger's car. Now you call them for a ride. I mean, think about what happened last ten years. I mean, absolutely. Things, things change in ten years. All right, verse number five. And Melon and Chilion died also both of them, and the women was left, and the and the woman was left of her two sons and her and her husband. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated. Life is a journey. But if we're not careful, we'll get caught at some of the turnoffs and the pull-offs. The efforts which we make to escape our destiny in our lives at times, only lead us into it. Yes. I, I think of the story. I, I said the life or, or, or the efforts which we make to escape our destiny only serve to lead us into it. Here's the destiny of, uh, of Naomi. And, of course, we're introduced to Ruth. And uh, through Naomi's life, we're shoveled into Ruth's life. And, and of course, we, we see her wonderful testimony. And we think of our great God and the grace that He's given us and the freedoms we have in Christ. And He's given us all the freedom to make, a, to make choices. We are not robots predestinated to somewhere. We have a free will that's a gift from God. Amen? Amen? And we exercise our free will every time we choose to obey or disobey God. And so He gave us freedom of choice. And, and we, we can ignore the will of God. We can argue with the will of God, disobey it, even fight against it. But in the end, the will of God shall prevail. Right. God's will will be done on earth. So we might as well be part of it, amen? amen. We might as well allow ourselves to, to humble ourselves. And, and by the way, God's looking for a broken and a contrite heart, a humble person that he can use and submit to his authority in, in their life and our life. And to, God's looking for that person. In fact, the Bible says in Psalms 30 or Psalm 33, 11, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever. God's will will be done. Daniel 4.35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and as he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand. God's will will be done. Right. Now, we have a choice tonight if we are going to allow ourselves to be in God. And when I say God's will, I'm talking about God's perfect will. Not his permissive will, which he allows because he's a gracious and loving God, but his perfect will for our life. That's our goal as a child of God. I think what the patriarch Job once asked, he said this in Job chapter 9, verse number 4. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered? That's a good question. You look at what happened, all, what's happening all over the world today. Who has hardened his heart against him and has prospered? The answer to that question is no one. That's right. No one. Job knew the answer, certainly. No one has hardened the heart. And by the way, Job came out a better man at the end of the book than he was at the beginning of the book. Because he allowed the process of God, because every product has a process. If we're to be conformed to the image of Christ, as God's will is for our lives, we must allow God's process as an individual in my life to do that. If we obey God's will in life, life tends to hold together. I mean, it, it may not be as easiest, and by the way, the easy way out is never, typically never the best way out. Uh, 
But typically, if we obey God's will in life, life tends to hold together. But if we disobey, that's when we get into trouble. That's when we begin to fall apart. And that's what you have here with Amalek and, and his wife Naomi. They, they flee God's place, and they, and they go to a place that wasn't God's place and to try to figure out their life when they should have just stayed in God's will. And nowhere in the, in the Bible is this truth better illustrated than in the experiences of Elimelech and his wife Naomi. So this evening, uh, we will see hopefully how unbelief leads us from the will of God. And by the way, a trust problem, a trust problem, specifically in God's Word and in God, you know, is a spiritual problem. It's a major spiritual problem. The, the, we live in a very distrustful society. No one trusts anyone it's because the devil's been at work. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. We must live a life of faith. Amen. We must trust the Lord. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. Please him. They, they chose Elimelech, led his wife and his family, his two boys, and they chose to displease the Lord by their choice. I hope tonight, by the end of this evening, may God have spoken to your heart about making the right choice. We are an outcome of our decisions that we make today. We are. And the decisions you made in the past has determined who you are today right now. Our decisions and our choices in life must reflect our Savior. First of all, we need to realize when we talk about the will of God, we don't need to run from our problems. Don't run from your problems. Christian, God has perfect timing. That's right, amen. He does. Life was not easy during the time of Judges. And we read in verse number one here, I thank you for the water. We read in verse number one here, now it came to pass in the days when the judges Rule. Life was not easy in Israel in the, in, in the days of the judges. In fact, the Bible says in Judges chapter 17 that there was no king in Israel, and every man did that was what was right in his own eyes. And in fact, if you read the book of Judges, it's a vicious cycle. Yes. Yes. It is. The children of Israel, the nation of Israel, would walk with the Lord. They trust Him for a little bit. They would do His will and His commandments, and then they would wander from the Lord. And they'd get far from God. And then they worship idols. And they would be taken into, by another country, taken into bondage. And then they would cry out to God. And, and here comes the cycle again. God would answer their prayers. They'd walk with Him. And over. You know, the Christian life is not designed to do that. I, I've dealt in my ministry, pastoring for 11 or so years. And, and uh, I've dealt with a lot of manic people. Up and down. Up and down. And down, real excited and real discouraged. Real excited and real dis discouraged. No balance in their life. You know, I find the Spirit of God, I find the Word of God brings a balance to a life. Amen. Yes. Absolutely. Here in the book of Ruth, chapter number one, we'll see that Israel was at one of its lowest points. Now listen to the description of Israel at this point. There was division in the land. Division in the land. There was Cruelty. Nobody was being nice to each other. Apostasy. A lot of false doctrine in the air. There was almost civil war. It was a time of national disgrace. Kind of sounds like a nation I know today. Are you with me? Cruelty. Have you seen any more cruelty than what that is being displayed in front of our eyes and played out today? I don't think I've lived in my lifetime where the division has been so big, it been so large and vast as it is today. It is a miracle that this tremendous story of redemption in the book of Ruth takes place in such a calamitous time. You know, that proves that God can work despite what's happening in this world. Amen. People still can be saved the old fashioned way. Amen. By the word of God. Amen. Absolutely. God can still build a work the old-fashioned way, the Bible way. During this dark time, God was seeking a bride, of course. We know that was Ruth in the story. Amen. It's today that God's seeking people. In fact, Jesus came, the Bible says, to seek and to save that which was lost. In the calamitous times that we live today, God's still seeking after those that are lost and perishing. 
Why? Because He's not one that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Amen. Absolutely. You see, God is always right on time. Right. And that might not be the best English, but I went to school in Oklahoma, so that's okay. <laughs> it's about the best I can do, brother. He's right on time. His timing is perfect. That's right. And it's typically when you're down to nothing that He is up to something. That's right. And when it seems like everything is over our head, we need to understand it's still under His feet. And he's in total control, and nothing takes him by surprise. It's never dawned on him the situation you're going in. He going through. He knows right where you are at. So don't run from your problems. Face up. Face up. John Wayne theology, the, theology, if there's any, get back on your horse. Yeah. <laughs> don't run. Don't quit. God has a right with the perfect timing. God has a right place as well. How strange that there should be a famine in Bethlehem. The Bible says there was a famine in Bethlehem. Verse number one. The word Bethlehem, you know the word, if you know, if you're a Bible student of the Bible, it means house of bread. In the Old Testament, famine was was evidence of God's discipline upon his children, upon his nation. Absolutely. And you need to realize this, during a time of famine, during a time of chastisement upon, upon God's nation, in those days, the godly had to suffer through it because of the ungodly. The godly had to suffer because of the ungodly. If Elimelech was a godly man, he would have stayed in the house of bread. He wouldn't have ran from his problems. You prove your lack of faith and your unbelief when you run from your problems. You prove who your Savior is and your love for God when you stay and face your problem. And when you deal with them in a biblical way, do you realize uh, every solution in life there's an answer to in this book? Amen. God's not left us out on the limb. Right. He's given us the path, the, the blueprint, the guidebook, the light to follow. Absolutely. God has us in the right place, my friend. That's why we don't run. God had them in the right place. They were in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Who leaves the house of bread in a famine? Amen. Come on. Now, I struggle with my weight. I, 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 I try to be athletic and, and stay in shape. And, and you say, well, rounds of shape. I know that. <laughs> I like to be a level-headed guy. The bubble's in the middle, you know. So, you know, I, you can tell when I don't go to the gym and I and I don't eat healthy, and I enter the season of kind of deputation again for our lives, and, and uh, being in church after church, and meeting after meeting, and missions conference, and eating out so much, I kind of, you know, it looked like I lived in the house of bread, amen? <laughs> we know where to find food, don't we? That's why there's 77,000 types of, 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 of a variety in, in every, the average uh, grocery store in America. And, you know, in the 1970s, I read this, only about 7,000, uh, there's only 7,000 choices you can make in an average grocery store in America. Now there's 77,000 choices. You know, the house of bread. God has us in the right place. Just because you're facing difficulties doesn't mean you're in the wrong place. Come on, Come on that's good. Yeah, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, Christians come and go through churches that left in the wrong time. Just when they need God the most, they, they quit on Him. I've seen church planners and pastors quit, and, and I know by the grace of God. But let me tell you, go I, but I, let me tell you this. Uh, if, we, if we leave during the hard times, what does that say about our faith? Somebody once said this, the level of our character is tested by what it takes to, to cause us to quit. Don't run from your problems. God has you in the right place. God has perfect timing. If, if, if Elimelech would have kept his wife Naomi... In, in Bethlehem, uh, that was the, God had a perfect time. He had a time he was going to change the situation. He had him in the right place. God wants us to make right decisions as well. We know the story. They, uh, they're faced with famine, as everybody else is in Bethlehem. And God's chastising his, ch his nation, his children, his people because of their sin. And uh, they made the choice to leave. And, and don't ever blame your sin on someone else. You know you don't have to sin. You don't have to smoke the next cigarette. You don't have to drink the next drink of liquor. You don't have to do that. Don't let the world tell you you have to do that. 
because it's a disease. Don't let them tell you that. If, if liquor is a disease, it's, if, if it's a true disease, it's the only disease we open the cooler for <laughs> and go to the supermarket for. It's a choice. You don't have to sin. Don't blame sin on God. God had no part in your sin. Amen? When you were drawn away, you weren't tempted. The Bible says you were tempted out of your own lust. We can't blame God for our sin. We have to make the right decision. God wants us to make the right choices. And when we choose to obey God, we're really choosing and showing our love for Him. When trouble comes into our lives, we can do, we can do one of three things. We can endure it. We can escape it. Or we can enlist it. I choose to enlist it. We should choose to enlist it. God wants you to enlist it. What does that mean? Use it. You know, I, I've had people over the years and they say, well, I'm just waiting for this to happen and I get through this ailment and this sickness and then I'm going to do this. No, maybe you have that sickness so you can, you're in contact with that nurse who, who needs to be witnessed to. Come on, that's good. We have to allow the situations of life to come our way, but we can use them for the glory of God. Amen. You don't look for the better situation before you serve God, before you pray, before you witness. You, 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 need, to, you need to enlist that situation and use it for the glory of God. Amen. If we only endure trials, trials become our master. Oh, how do you feel today? Oh, I just have had a bad, bad week. That's all you talk about is your trials and your pains and your sufferings. They're like you're their master. It's like your trials are, are your master. You bounce from one to another. If we try to escape our trials, then we'll miss the purpose for them that God has given us that He wants us to achieve during those trials. If we learn to enlist our trials, they will become our servants instead of our masters. They will work for us Come on, you know the verses in the New Testament. You know Romans 8, 28. You know this. And we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Everything He's allowed to come into your life is for your betterment and for His glory. Absolutely. You see... When we have a choice to make, we must make. When we have a choice to make, when we're facing difficult situations, we must choose not to run from our problems. Secondly, we need to walk by. Well, I'll say this. I'll say it this way: unbelief walks by sight, not by faith. Yeah. Unbelief walks by sight, not by faith. And, and by the way, we, we have. Uh, the wrong perspective, typically, Preach. of situations. We do. We, we go through a hard situation. We think it's much worse than it is. We do. We think, what are we going to do? Oh, my goodness. I, I, I can't believe this is happening. And then, then you get through that, and you realize, well, it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. Come on. So we typically we see something hard or difficult, some pressing circumstances come our way. We, we typically make them bigger than they actually are. We also see things better than they are at times. Absolutely. That's why we see the sin in others bigger than in others' lives, bigger than our own sin in our own lives. We, we, th we, we typically view situations with the wrong perspective. We think they're better than they are, or we think they're worse than they are. Only God has the right perspective. Amen. That's why He wants His children to walk by faith, not by sight. No matter how difficult our circumstance is, may we be we are the safest and the best place is, is the will of God. That's why it's not to run, Elimelech. It's not to go away, Elimelech, and lead your family where your boys are going to die, where you're going to die. It's, it's not a good place to go. Walk by faith. Claim the promises of God's Word. Every promise that God has spoken has come true or will come true. People don't just like the Bible because there's contradictions in it. Now, I know a popular magazine their smart editors got together here this past week, and they wrote a, a, a big article about the worst book ever written. They said it was the Bible, worst book. And they said because it's one of the reasons because it's full of contradictions. No, they don't like the Bible because it's full of contradictions. They don't like the Bible because it contradicts them. Amen. That's why they don't like the Bible. You know, every promise that God's spoken has come true or will come true. 
If God commanded it, He's going to give you the faith to believe it. He's going to give you the ability to do it. Absolutely. How does faith come? By hearing. Hearing of what? The Word of God. Walk by faith. Well, I need things explained to me. You know, we don't... We live on promises, not explanations, my friend. In spite of what you see, or how you feel, or what may happen, you need to continue to trust God. In spite of what you see, or how you feel, there's going to be days you don't feel like it. I just don't feel like coming to church. Well, you need, that's the day you need to be there. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. Some of my, you know, uh, 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 the, you know, I think there are going to be flops is when I'm just exhausted and I feel I don't even feel like preaching today. And I get up there and I feel that was the worst one ever I've ever preached in my life. And that's when people say it was the best one ever. So I tell them, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I think you preach a good message and it goes over like a lead balloon. You, you, you preach the worst one ever. You know, that's when the altars are full. Why? Because that's God. Because God doesn't want me in the equation. God doesn't want you in the equation. He wants, he wants himself to work through us. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Walk by faith. Commit yourself to the Lord and rely totally upon Him. Walk by faith. Live by faith. Faith glorifies God. Amen. It does. Jesus is called to be a light. Now, I, I found out it's a lot darker up here in the Northwest. <laughs> and it's not because of all the trees. It's, a lot, it's dark. But in the dark of the night, the light of the bright. Amen. Yep. doesn't matter where the darkness is. You turn that light switch and the darkness flees. Absolutely. No, uh, living by faith is a, is a witness to the lost world. Amen. You know, you're, you're witnessing to someone. That takes courage and faith. Absolutely. I, I, I knock doors all the time. That's what I've done. I'm a church planner. That's what I do. I, I'm still petrified and scared to death every time I go to a door. Why? Because it's a work of faith. Amen. It's a work of faith. It's not a work of... The, it's God that gives the increase, amen? That's right, amen. We're obedient. We go and tell them and, and show them from God's Word how they can be saved. It's God that gives the increase. I've never saved one person. It's Jesus that saves. Amen. It's a work of faith. You, you think, well, I'm just waiting until I feel comfortable and, and I get to know the Bible better and, and then I'll be a witness. No, 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 no. Listen, listen. The best, test, the best witnessing tool you have is your own testimony. The greatest soul winners in the Bible weren't the people that had the Bible memorized. Amen? In fact, those are the crowd that didn't like Jesus. The greatest soul winners, all they said is, come and see the one that saved me. Look at the change he's made in my life. And, and by the way, the, best, the po most powerful uh, uh, display of, 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 of God's saving power is, is a changed life. Amen. Remember that demoniac of Gadara? He's in his right mind, all clothed. Changed life. People say, whoa, they automatically knew God did something. Nobody had to explain. God did something there. Why? Live by faith. Then by faith builds Christian character. Absolutely. The Bible says in Romans 1.17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Faith. But by faith. There's a wisdom of this world that leads to folly and sorrow. And there's a wisdom from God that seems folly to this world, but leads to blessing. That's faith. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.18, Let no man dece deceive himself. If any a man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. There's a foolishness to this world. The world says, that's foolish, but that's what God blesses. And don't equate the blessings of God on materialistic or, or temporal possessions. Don't do that. Because there's Christians meeting on the other side of the globe tonight who are saved by the same Savior you have who experience the same joy and the same peace, yet they have nothing. Right. I'll tell you this, they're blessed of God. Right. 
our blessings. Just because we have nice clothes and live in a nice house and have a nice car and have nice things and, and have abundance of choices and, at Walmart, that doesn't mean we're, we're, we're blessed particularly. We can't equate temporal things to the blessings of God. I mean, I mean that's part of it, but that's not the only reason, amen? That's right. amen. amen. Absolutely. Isaiah 5.21, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. I'm telling you, there's the wisdom of this world that leads to folly and sorrow. But there's a wisdom from God that seems folly to this world that leads to blessings. It's the blessing. That's faith. It's faith. If Elimelech would have said, Honey, we're not going to go. I changed my mind. I changed my mind. We're not going to go to Moab, that distant place. We're not going to go to that place where the blessings of God aren't promised. We're going to stay here in the house of Bethlehem. God's promised to bless His people. <laughs> Unbelief walks by sight, not by faith. Unbelief majors on the physical and not the spiritual. A husband and a father certainly wants to provide for his wife and children, but he must not do it at the expense of missing the blessing of God. Turn back, look at, look at the Ruth chapter number 1 again. The Bible says in verse number 2, And they came into a country of Moab and continued there. It means they moved there. They moved in. They begin to live. They continued living there. I, I've seen many men lead their family astray because of the pursuit of what they can see and what they can have. I've seen many Christians go the wrong way. It was all by sight. They focused on the physical and not the spiritual. You know, it's a spiritual book. It is. It's their only offensive weapon in spiritual warfare. To live, it's the living Word of God. One of Satan's pet lies is, you know, he must have told this to Elimelech. You have to live. You have to make a living. You have to provide for your family. You can't do anything here. There's no, you can't make, you can make $5 more an hour if you move to the next city. You can move on down the road and make, a, make a five more thousand dollars a year, ten more thousand dollars a year. I, I, that, 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 that's, he must have whispered there's something in his ears. When Satan tempted Christ, his first temptation was to suge suggest that Christ satisfy his hunger rather than please his Father. You know the story. 40 days and 40 nights of fasting in the wilderness. First temptation. Uh, you know, choose to satisfy your hunger over over your heavenly father. You know, uh, the devil's going to lie to you. He's going to say, well, you, you deserve it. You're going to take care of yourself first. First. I, I think about King David. I, I think his witness is worth considering. Psalm 37, verse 25, he said this, I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. You see, that principle didn't begin with King David or David. That principle began at the beginning of time. You see, there wasn't a, God wasn't harsh here. Elimelech should have stayed. God's principle would have came through for him. He would have provided. He would have made a way to escape. God would have provided for Elimelech. But Elimelech lacked faith. Instead of trusting his heavenly father, he began to distrust him. Look at Acts chapter 20. Leave your place in, in the book of Ruth here. Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. Am I doing okay on time, brother? Yep. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. All righty. It says here. That's what I want. Uh, yep. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. If there was one saint that could have quit along the way, it could have been Paul. 
If he had many excuses, it could have been Paul. He faced a very threatening future. He could have said, you know what, yeah, I'm just going to take, I'm just going to cut out here, guys, and uh, uh, take a sabbatical here. And, and it could have been Paul, but he went forward anyway. Why? The very same apostle through the Spirit of God who, who quoted from the book of Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith, he was living out what God inspired him to write. The just shall live by faith. If you're looking for a reason to quit, the devil will give you millions of them. And that, and, and our, and our, minds, our minds play games on us, don't they? Yeah. You can have a thousand people do a thousand good things to you all week long, and you have one person, one curmudgeon, there's always one, and that's the person that has all your focus. God blesses you abundantly daily. You can't even keep count of the blessings of God in your life. That one bad thing happens at work. Your wife does this, kids do this, husband does this, or whatever it is. And that's all you focus on. In times of difficulty, we must do what the Apostle Paul learned to do. By the way, he said he learned. He learned to be content. Mm -hmm. Tells me there's a process. Every product has a process. Right. We need to learn to be content. In times of difficulty, we must die to self, as the Apostle Paul did, and put God's will first. Jesus said in the, Beata in the Sermon on the Mount, He said in Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Elimelech should have stopped his wife and his, and his two boys. And he said, we're going to stop. We're going to stay. We're going to seek God first. No matter what happens, even if we have to starve, it's better here in God's will than somewhere else. Than somewhere else. We can be sure that God will either take us out of the trouble or bring us through it. Because that's the God we serve. Amen. Amen. And let me tell you this. For the Christian, our future is always better. Amen. It is. Amen. We have that hope that abideth inside. By the way, we have to be ready to give a reason of that hope that, that lives inside of us. Amen. We have hope because of what happened on Calvary. We have hope today because of the empty, empty tomb. Christian, God will get you through it or He'll take you out of it. But it's always better. Unbelief honors the enemy over the Lord. It does. He moves his family to Moab. The, Mo the Moabites were descendants of Lot from his relationship with his firstborn daughter. They were a cursed people. They were the enemies of God. They were enemies because of the way they, they, they treated Israel during their pilgrim journey from Egypt. The Moabites, the Mo this is who they were. During the time of the judges, they invaded Israel and ruled over them for 18 years. Why did Elimelech go there? Why would anybody in their right mind, you ever thought about that? When something happens and someone does something, we say, why in the right mind would they do that? You ever done that yourself? Why in my right mind did I do that? Why did I ever do that? Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Because we didn't trust the Lord. Elimelech ran to the enemies of God. He, that's what, the, that's what our, our lack of faith does. It puts our, the enemies of God above, our, above, above the Lord. It honors them, not the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to honor God. Amen. I want to be blessed by God. I don't have an affiliation with some enemy. And you, know, you know what I'm saying. God loves everyone. and there's no, He's not an enemy with any person. He wants to save every one of them. But you know what I'm saying? I don't want anything in my life, my testimony, my witness to reflect what his book and what his ways don't stand for. Amen. And that's what Elimelech did when he left and went to Moab, of all places. Ultimately, unbelief leads us to uncontrollable consequences. You see, we can control our decisions. We can control our decisions. But once we make that choice, the consequences are out of our hands. So I'd rather, honor, I'd rather choose to obey God and honor Him because He holds our future. 
The word Elimelech means my God is king. That's what it means. In the Hebrew, in the, in the Jewish tradition, names have a have heavy meaning. I think it's kind of interesting. His name means my God is king. Sadly, the Lord was not the king of his life, for he left God completely out of the, out of the decision. You ever do that? You ever try to seek for advice and you call someone and you, you call the person because you know what they're going to say and you're going to agree with what they say? Here, here's, some, here's some help. Don't call that person for counsel. Amen. Amen. Call someone who is going to tell you the truth Amen. despite what the consequences may be. Amen. No nearness is likeness. Birds of a feather do flock together. Right. Absolutely. You find this, you take a bunch of teenagers to teen camp and the good kids find the good kids and the bad kids find the bad kids and you get home from camp and why did you, my kid got in trouble? He went with the wrong crowd. You let him go up. No, that's who he was before he got there. Yeah. It was just revealed by who he chose to associate with. The Bible says there's a wisdom in a multitude of counselors. Find someone who's going to tell you the truth. He made a decision out. He made a decision out of God's will when he left for Moab. This led to another bad decision. His two sons married women of Moab. Elimelech and his family fled Judah to escape death, but the three men met death just the same. They left to escape death, but they died. Anyway, sad, avoidable, avoidable. Isn't it tragic when you watch a young person grow up and they go on a series of choices been avoidable? I mean, th their life ended in destruction. It would have been avoidable if they just would have made one different choice. But the same is with us. Most of the problems we find ourselves in are caused by our own selves. And, the, and, the, and, and written across there should be avoidable. Avoidable. They had a plan to sojourn, but no one really sojourns. They typically stay. Well, I have this, uh, my kid plays Little League, and we'll miss Wednesday nights and Sunday nights and and occasional weekends for tournaments, but we're going to continue at church. We're just going to sojourn in Little League. And the odds of a kid playing professional baseball when he grows up? You know the odds of you raising a godly child? You know, they're a little higher. You know why? Because you have God on your side. You can have Tony Lasorda on your side as a Little Leaguer and still not make the major leagues. But you have God on your side when you try to raise a kid for him. And his power. At the end of 10 years, the only thing that remained were three lonely widows and three graves in a heathen land. We can't run from our problems, my friend. We can't avoid taking with us the cause of the most of our problems because our wicked, unbelieving heart will accompany us along the journey. Somebody once said this, the majority of us begin with the bigger problems outside and forget the one on the inside. A man has to learn the plague of his own heart before his own problems can be solved. That's right. Amen. That's right. That's good. We get upset at Emelimelech leading his family to a foreign land. We say, why didn't you just stop and say, turn around, let's go back home. See, the problem wasn't just on the outside. The problem began in here when he began to doubt God. God, we're hungry. God, my paycheck, my paycheck is shrinking. The bills are getting bigger. I have no food. Men are being laid off. I just got laid off, God. Now what? Look what you've done. Famine. You control things, God. The, the divide between him and his Lord further and further, and he felt the only way out was to leave. You know, I don't know what you're at tonight. If you're in the processes of this, it's in your heart tonight. You need to stop. God, I want to stay. 
I don't want to pursue this life living by sight. I want to start living by faith. I don't want to walk by what I see. I want to walk by what I cannot see. I want to walk by faith. Maybe you've already made the decision. You're in the process. Okay, yeah, I've tried that God thing, but we're going we're gonna to kind of distance ourselves. We're going to cut back. No, no, you need to get back. Amen. Get back. That's good. Maybe you're in Moab. Moab. Just pick up your stuff and get back to Bethlehem, wherever you may be tonight. Let's go ahead and stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. I don't know where you are, my friend, but you stand in tragedy. You don't have to go that way. You're a product of your decision. Elimelech was a product of his choice. He chose to go to Moab. He lost his life. His boys died. Could have been different. Why don't you come tonight? Why don't you come? Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your powerful word. Lord, I pray if there's anybody that's discouraged that wants to quit because of a problem, I pray they'd be encouraged to go forward. I pray they find a spot tonight and do what David did, encourage himself in you. Lord, you know what we're facing. You know what we're walking through. But we know that you're in control. You hold our future. I pray you be with that person this evening who's wavering, who's thinking about leaving. Oh, Lord, even that person that may be in Moab tonight, I pray you bring him back home. Bless now this invitation in Jesus' name. Okay, heads bowed, eyes closed. If, if you are not, if you've never put your faith in Jesus for salvation and you're not sure you're going to heaven, it's time to take care of that right now. When, it's, when the song begins, just leave, walk up here and just say, Pastor, I'd like to see from, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I'd like to see how I could be sure. We'll be glad to take the Bible and show you how. But Christian, are you walking by faith? Are you walking by sight? That's what it's all about tonight. Are you walking by faith? Are you living by faith? Trust in God, trust in his word, or are you living by sight? Okay, are, are you living by what you see, what you feel? Okay, it ought to be by faith. That's the right way to live. That's the only way a Christian ought to live. And if you're not living that way, it's time to get that right and get it fixed tonight. All right, let's all, let's all obey the Holy Spirit, do exactly what he tells us to do as the song begins.